we can go ahead and get started. Great. Uh, so we're uh, very happy to have Dr. Carrie Schaefer join us today for Cardiology Grand Rounds. Um, I was just hearing uh, Dr. Schaefer is originally from New Mexico, where she uh, developed a lifelong love of green chilies. Um, <laughs> fell in love with um, cardiology or had great mentorship from a cardiologist. Um, and that prompted her to seek additional training in internal medicine uh, at uh, BI. Um, following which she did a cardiology fellowship at UT Southwestern and then came back to um, Brigham and Boston Children's Hospital to do a fellowship in uh, congenital heart disease as well as uh, pulmonary hypertension. Um, and she's now established a clinic uh, to see adult congenital heart disease patients uh, at BIDMC. Um, so we look forward to uh, hearing her talk today on um, modern and historical management of uh, TGA. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Yeah, it's such a pleasure to be here. I've been uh, waiting to come back um, and I'm so pleased to be able to speak today at the Grand Rounds. Um, unusually so. And let me just say, I hope everyone's doing well out there. I know this has been difficult um, for a lot of people. Um, in particular, I think BI has been pit, hit pretty hard. Um, so uh, to sort of change our focus briefly onto congenital heart disease, uh, thank you so much for logging in this morning. What I'd like to do is talk about transposition of the great arteries. And the reason why is because this is one of the most common diagnoses I've seen so far here at BI. Um, I think that the reason, and maybe it's evident here on this slide, um, is because um, amongst many different areas of expertise, I think that here at BI we have a particular expertise in people who deal with arrhythmias and in people who deal with aortic disease and coronary artery disease. And these are the most common issues of patients with transposition of the great arteries. And so I think not only do we have a fair amount of patients with transposition, I think we're going to continue to have a fair amount of patients with transposition. And so what I hope today is to give you all a little bit of an idea of what to do when you initially see the patients and what concerns and complications you need to think about. It's too short of a time to talk about all of the comprehensive management decisions, but I will tell you that the data I'm presenting is sort of the best data that we have. And some of those other complicated discussions such as how to, how, what medical therapy is best for these patients really just hasn't been um, discovered uh, all that well. So let's, uh, let's start with a couple of potential cases. So a 45-year-old woman presents to the emergency room with transposition of the great arteries um, with shortness of breath and palpitations. So this was a patient I actually saw uh, when I was a resident um, at BI. So the West Campus ER. Heart rate is 102. Can this be arrhythmia? She has palpitations. She has transposition. So you know she has scar in her heart somewhere. Um, so hopefully at the end of this talk, we'll have an idea of how to think about her. Contrasting that with a 23-year-old man uh, presenting from a local emergency room, a uh, local college uh, to the emergency room with transposition and chest pain. And then the question is always chest pain. Does that mean he has coronary disease? Is he too young for coronary disease? What about his transposition should make me think about his arteries or should I be thinking about something else? Um, so we're going to talk a little bit essentially about these two patients today. But before we do that, I just want to get it out there that there's more than one type of transposition. We're going to be talking about D-loop transposition of the great arteries, but I want to talk a little bit about the differences. So D-loop transposition is diagnosed in infancy. The reason is because there's only one issue, which is a big one. The aorta comes off of the right ventricle. So blue blood goes to the aorta and makes a circle. And then the red blood comes in from the pulmonary veins, goes to the pulmonary artery and back again. So a tinier circle. So these are not in series, they're in parallel. And so because of that, in infancy, the babies need an immediate procedure in order to survive, whether it's a balloon atrial septostomy, which is commonly done, um, or something to keep the patent ductus arteriosus open, or an immediate arterial switch, um, as would be the contemporary management today. Contrasting that with something called L-loop transposition of the great arteries. The L-loop refers to the ventricular looping, and this is that segmental diagnosis that we use at Children's. It's not critical to understand the segmental diagnosis. It's just important to know that just like a pacemaker, um, it's the location of the atrium, the location of the ventricles, and the location of the great arteries that these letters mean. 
Um, and the issue here, so normal is SDS, so this patient only has the D problem, meaning that the aorta and pulmonary artery are switched. Um, in L-loop transposition, the ventricles and the great arteries are, are abnormal. And this results in the so-called congenitally corrected or physiologically corrected transposition of the great arteries. And the reason why um, that's sort of an important distinction is because in the end, blue blood gets to the lungs and red blood gets to the body. The problem here is that the right ventricle is the systemic right ventricle. And so for that reason, these patients still have lifelong issues. Contrasting further, they both have the same issue. Um, if they have atrial switch, D-loop transposition of patients have systemic right ventricles and atrial arrhythmias, just like L-loop transposition patients. They're both at increased risk for sudden cardiac death, but the difference here is surgery is performed worldwide consistently for D-loop transposition, and there's really no way to know what happens with L-loop transposition. Um, another key feature of D-loop versus L-loop is the fact that D-loop is way, way, way more common. Um, roughly, I think, five times more common uh, D is D-loop transposition. And so for that reason, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I can come back at a different time, and I'm happy to speak to anybody about the physiologically corrected transposition, which is also quite interesting. Okay, so what is D-loop transposition of the great arteries? It's uncommon, but when it comes to complex congenital heart disease, it's tied with tetralogy of flow. In our adult population, um, tetralogy of flow is more common because the surgery issues that we'll talk about today. But I think going forward, we're going to see an equal number of TGA and trans, uh, tetralogy of flow patients in our adults. Um, it's associated with a couple of different exposures. Um, I'm sure many of you have had kids or you yourself have been on Accutane. And this is actually one of the reasons why you shouldn't get pregnant while on Accutane. Um, the embryologic formation is unclear, but it's probably related to the way that the um, truncus, like the big structure that is the aorta and pulmonary artery embryologically, the way that it separates. And if it doesn't separate properly, then that results in the um, abnormal location of the aorta and the pulmonary artery relative to each other. There is a common association with VSDs, LVOT obstruction, and anomalous coronaries. And we're going to talk a little bit about the implications of these things today. And it uh, has a, a very, very, very high mortality in the first year without surgery. So if you get surgery, then your age matters. And so that's why in that initial example that we talked about, it's actually really important to pay attention to the fact that the first patient was 45 and the second patient was 22, because chances are pretty good. That 45 year old had the atrial switch procedure. So these two procedures, um, are, were discovered actually, this, uh, the transposition um, corrective surgery is quite intuitive, just switching the arteries back. However, the ability to do this procedure, meaning the ability to move the coronary arteries, wasn't really perfected until the 80s and wasn't done at Children's until 83, um, which was the use of coronary buttons. So up until uh, the 80s, nobody had really figured out that you have to take a piece of the aorta with the coronary artery as opposed to cutting the coronary artery off itself. And that really just relates to the fact that the coronary arteries and neonates are about the size of an angel hair pasta. So extremely, extremely tiny. And so anastomosing these tiny, tiny coronary arteries and these babies in a way that will allow them to grow was quite difficult. And so this surgery was perfected in, in 85. And so between the 70s and 1985, um, a couple of other surgeons figured out ways to get the blue blood to the lungs, um, albeit not ideally, but in a way that actually worked and allowed the babies to live. So essentially, the atrial switch switches the blood going into the heart, and the arterial switch switches the blood coming out of the heart. So the atrial switch comes in two different varieties, and here are the diagrams, um, Senning and Mustard. Essentially, either way, you get the same results from the diagram previously, where the blue blood goes into the left ventricle and out to the pulmonary artery. Um, you end up having a systemic right ventricle, which is problematic, but it's better than the alternative, which is to be extremely blue and then not survive childhood. Um, these are just diagrams really more um, just to know as reference, um, the issue here um, with the sinning is that it was difficult but brilliant. So this procedure uses the atrial septum itself with a complex sort of series of folds, essentially. I've heard it called the origami surgery. 
um, where you fold back the back wall of the vena cava and fold the uh, back wall of the atrium up so that the pulmonary veins can now come in the opposite side. It's brilliant. It's just very difficult to do. And so as a result, the mustard atrial switch was designed. Um, and what uh, the point of this diagram to show you all is I think you can probably intuit that it's more of kind of turning um, a single floor house into two floors that are very small and have to kind of pass over each other. And that's important because of the complications that we're going to see going forward. I think the other reason I wanted you all to see all of this is how much surgery is actually going on in the atrium in both locations. And so then it's probably not surprising to you that there's a ton of atrial scar and thus the setup for atrial arrhythmias. Um, here's an example. So before we move any further, further, I just wanted to show you what it looks like. So this is an apical four-chamber view of a patient with transposition of the great arteries. And here is the echo. So this is the left ventricle. As you can see here, it's small, underfilled, um, probably doesn't have a wall thickness of one. It's probably less than one centimeter. And then the right ventricle here is beefy looking, hypertrabeculated. And in this case, squeezes okay, but not great. Um, and here is a close-up view of the baffle. So this is the pulmonary venous baffle kind of coming in here. Um, the pulmonary veins come through this ostium that was surgically created into the what was formerly known as the right atrium. We now call it the pulmonary venous atrium just for um, clarity. And then it goes into the right ventricle. And so this is just a little um, still frame of the pulmonary venous flow into the right ventricle. So here you can see the red blood comes into the formal, the pulmonary venous atrium across the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. And then here is the blue blood into the left ventricle. Okay, so what's the issue here? Um, you know, we've got pulmonary venous blood going to the systemic ventricle. So we've got red blood going to the aorta. Um, we've got blue blood going to the lungs, ventricles are ventricles, right? So it should be fine. Well, it turns out that that's obviously not the case, as I'm sure most of you know, um, that right ventricles don't ever really act fully as a, as a systemic pump in the way that they should. And here's um, one of my favorite articles showing the difference in strain. Um, so what you can see here are three different strain patterns. So this is longitudinal followed by circumferential and then the ECG for reference. Um, so the normal right ventricle is predominantly longitudinal strain, which we know. The normal left ventricle is predominantly circumferential strain. And over time, what happens to the systemic right ventricle is that it kind of gets a merge of both. So the longitudinal strain goes down, circumferential strain goes up, never quite normal. But the biggest or one of the biggest issues is the fact that there's absolutely no torsion of the systemic right ventricle. And so the combination of those three things um, results in abnormal contraction pattern of the systemic right ventricle and the inherent risk of the patient to have systemic right ventricular failure. Another issue is the anatomic location of things. So one of the things, and I'll just show you on this diagram here, is the tricuspid valve. You probably remember that the tricuspid valve has septal attachments. The mitral valve does not. And so because of those septal attachments, with any dilation of the right ventricle, you have tethering of the septal leaflet. And that results in tricuspid regurgitation, which begets more tricuspid regurgitation. And so these patients often have severe tricuspid regurgitation due to tethering of the leaflets, as well as systemic ventricular dysfunction, secondary, at least in part, to the myocardial contraction pattern, as well as probably a number of other issues. Um, so what happens to these patients? Well, it's not great news. It's better than the neonatal mortality, of course, but um, these patients have um, about a 40% mortality at, uh, at 40 years, um, or maybe not even quite that, um, according to this, this exact graph. Um, and so the outcome's not great, uh, but the patients do actually have a much better outcome than they would have originally. Um, location of surgery does change your mortality a bit. Um, there's certainly a lot, at least, and certainly in, in my years of taking care of adults with congenital heart disease, I've certainly seen a variation with regards to the surgical technique used by each individual surgeon. You can almost tell um, which surgeon did the surgery based on what the complications are. Um, the outcomes are better with 
without associated defects. And that's, we were talking about what's associated with transposition. VSDs are a common association and patients with VSDs have worse outcomes, probably for a variety of reasons, not least of which they just have more scar. Um, however, patients with outflow tract obstruction actually do better. And that's probably because it shifts the septum over to the left ventricle. And, uh, oh, sorry, away from the left ventricle and allows the LV to be a little bit bigger. Um, the setting may or may not be better. So I showed you those two differences just so that you knew um, that the setting is actually predominantly just using atrial tissue. Um, and some people think that that results in less surgical scar um, and probably less baffle complications because the setting can probably grow with the patient better than the mustard. Um, but I think that in the end, I'm not sure everybody really believes this because the sending was such a difficult procedure that it tended not to be done in the way that Dr. Sending intended. Sudden death is the most common perioperative mortality if you're from Belgium, um, but, but heart failure is the most common death um, in other studies, including Canadian um, and Swiss studies. Um, but the biggest issue and the reason why I'm talking about it here today with you all um, is because atrial arrhythmias are so incredibly common. Um, arrhythmias occurred in 65% of those who lived greater than 25 years in this study, and there are reports of an even higher rate um, in other studies. So how do we predict these outcomes? Obviously, um, we want to monitor these patients carefully. And as you can see here, the systemic ventricular function is proportional to survival. Other things. Um, that are proportional uh, to survival is the echocardiographically obtained strain, which relates to a number of different um, important heart failure measures. And then uh, cardiac MRIs are actually quite helpful as well. One thing that's very interesting about uh, the CMR findings in transposition patients with systemic right ventricles is the prevalence of scar. Um, so not surprisingly, that correlates with an increased risk of arrhythmia and heart failure. Um, so systemic right ventricles have decreased mortality. The imaging can be useful to determine which patients are at risk. And MRI shows scar and potentially so sources of arrhythmias. And I think when it comes to arrhythmias, it's really a matter of when. Um, some studies showed up to 65%, others show up to 85%. The majority of these patients have atrial arrhythmias, although other types of supraventricular tachycardias are not uncommon. Additionally, patients also get sinus node dysfunction, and that's because if you think back to where that um, atrial surgery was in the setting of the mustard in particular, it goes right through the region of the SVCRA junction and thus the area where the sinus node intersects. And so as a result, um, patients with transposition with atrial switches have sinus node dysfunction. IART is the most common type of, of atrial arrhythmia that patients have and be probably because of the scar, although hopefully Dr. Zimmett-Vom is on can, can elucidate more on this if anyone would like. Um, these patients have a lower cycle length. And so if you think back to that original case that I showed you, this 45-year-old woman with, an atrial, with worries for atrial arrhythmia with a heart rate of 102, unfortunately that, that is actually a very common presentation because these cycle lengths typically are much slower and thus a two to one um, conduction could absolutely have a patient's heart rate at, a, at 100. Um, the biggest issue we need to also think about um, is sudden death, and unfortunately, the rate is actually quite common at 5% every 10 years, but we do not have good guidelines for primary prevention ICD. The only data that I'm aware of shows that secondary prevention ICDs work quite well, and primary prevention ICDs have frequent inappropriate shocks, um, almost more commonly than appropriate shocks. Um, I'd like to pause just for a second. Uh, I see there's a chat. Yes, Dr. Zimmerbaum. Typical atrial flutter is the most common. Okay, so tell me, tell me, Dr. Zimmerbaum, I had read that the typical, the pathway is typical, but the cycle length is slower. Is, do you find that to be the case? I don't know, maybe he can't unmute himself. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Um, and so just, you know, the biggest issue that I always get asked is whether or not we can put defibrillators in these patients, and the answer is no. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> Great. Um, all right. So thinking back to the, to the uh, oh, wait, I'll see. There's, it seems like we have maybe another chat. 
Oh yeah, Did you, yeah. I, Go ahead. yeah. I've been unmuted. You're right. You're, you're right. It's still that. It's still that the uh, the cycle lengths are slower, but the uh, but the circuit is still pretty typical. So I mean, we don't do a lot of these cases. They're done by your group, but mm -hmm. um, they are the the baffle puncture still is you know there's a bap the procedure involves a baffle puncture and the but the uh but the ablation is still the same one we do for most of our patients right sided cable tricuspid uh isthmus ablation okay yeah thank you yeah. um yeah. So yeah, and then just getting to that, here's the baffle. Um, so um, in addition to having the issues related to systemic ventricular dysfunction, together with um, the risk for atrial scar related issues, um, there's also just issues with the baffle itself. This is sort of true, and I, I tell this to every uh, fellow that comes through our group uh, at, at Children's. If there's a surgery, it's going to have a complication. You're going to have to look at whatever was surgically created um, long term because the chances are pretty good it's going to be problematic. And this is a perfect example of that. So here is an angiography of the atrial baffle, and this is a patient with a mustard. Um, so what you can see here is the catheter is in the SVC. This is the systemic venous baffle going over to the left ventricle. Um, and what you can see here is that the patient had initially quite significant baffle stenosis, not uncommon. Uncommon to have both baffles be stenosed at the same time, but nonetheless, uh, this SVC baffle stenosis can happen. Um, this alone uh, can happen up to 40% of patients. Um, and so what can happen is that these get narrowed and then you have to think about intervening both for symptomatic reasons, but also often because we need to put pacemaker leads um, through them. Um, another issue that happens is you get leaks, and it's kind of what Dr. Zimmerbaum is talking about. Sometimes we create them in the setting of needing to do an ablation, so needing to cross this surgically created tunnel and get into um, the other atrium, um, or because we need to um, place a d devices or whatever. Uh, that's one reason, but the other reason is because as the patients grow, these become um, stiff and quite calcified. Um, so anyone who would like uh, has the opportunity, any fellow um, has the opportunity to come over to Children's and come to our anatomic lab. And what you can see there is uh, are some atrial baffles of patients that have died. And it's quite remarkable. These baffles feel like bone. Um, they are actually extremely calcified, very rigid. And I think important to think about with regards to uh, intervening uh, for sure, um, interventions on these patients is much more complicated than any other um, systemic venous intervention. And also just to consider the fact that these uh, hemodynamically are quite problematic, so they're extremely stiff. And so it's kind of imagining that you have like a metal cage within, within the atrium. Um, so leaking and stenosis are very common baffle complications themselves in addition to the surgical scar that they have been associated with. And then this is just an example of a cardiac CT to just see this better. I'm um, just showing that really the best way to look at the pulmonary vein and systemic venous channels is with cardiac CT. So this is a little bit of an off axis picture, but showing the SVC and then the um, SVC uh, pacemaker wire essentially coming across and showing that there is a little bit of SVC baffle narrowing. Um, but this is also a really nice picture of a pulmonary vein channel going into the left, uh, sorry, going into the right ventricle. So this is just a picture of that apical four chamber view, but on CT, um, showing essentially what you would have seen if you could have seen the whole heart. Just to give you guys an example of what it actually looks like. Quite distorted cardiac structure, definitely um, abnormal imaging planes, um, and thus uh, cross-sectional imaging is really key to the evaluation of these patients. So um, what do we do with patients with transposition and arterial switches? Well, here are the guidelines. Um, there are two documents that I'd like to tell you about today. I think the first is this uh, document here. So the ACC and the AHA collaborated to create guidelines for transposition, sorry, for uh, all of adult congenital heart disease, including transposition. Um, it was published in 2018 and is a great resource. Um, they even have an app with a number of different very helpful um, uh, interactive uh, thought trees to help you how to de uh, decide how to take care of patients. Um, and these are, just th these are just the guidelines on DTGA. Unfortunately, not all that robust. Just talking about the fact that these patients tend to have atrial complications 
arrhythmia complications, and that they often need um, cross-sectional imaging. Um, and this is kind of the one slide that I am talking about therapy, because uh, there's really not a lot of great data. Um, Guideline-directed medical therapy um, with attention uh, to the anticoagulation is what's recommended. Unfortunately, there's really no good data about what to do with heart failure patients with transposition of the great arteries in a systemic right ventricle. The largest study, I think, has 80 patients in it. And um, something I'm, I guess, fairly vocal about is my uh, distrust, as I'm sure you, have all, you all would as well um, have for a study with 80 people making statements about things such as beta blockers or ACE inhibitors. Um, so while there have been very tiny studies done, um, they have been inconclusive by and large, in part due to the fact that they're inadequately powered and also in part to the fact that they have um, fairly short follow-up times looking for um, outcomes that are unlikely to occur in the period of time of evaluation. Um, so I'll pause there. Uh, do people have questions about transposition with an atrial switch? This is Arthi. I've taken, I've allowed everyone to come off mute if you'd like to ask Carrie a question or please feel free to send them in the chat and I can read them. So this represents a an era of patients that will only exist for a bit longer. So as you saw, um, it's really between 1970 and 1985 that you had to have been born and been at a surgical center. So those patients, it's only 15 years, you know, so we're only going to have those patients a little bit longer. Um, the most common reason I think we are going to see those patients, and I think we're going to see them a lot more commonly in the next 10 years, is because they're all getting arrhythmias and they're all getting heart failure. And the management of these patients can be similar to standard heart failure arrhythmia patients with these slight anatomic variations. And so it's really important to think about the cross-sectional imaging that we talked about and the unique considerations for the arrhythmia management. All right. Um. So we do have one question <clears throat> from Warren Manning. Are there any data to support the level one recommendation for annual echo or CMR? <laughs> I'm not aware actually of the data suggesting that they need to have um, that they need to have the CMR. I think I think this statement is a little bit um, misleading. What this and I skipped over that part is the anatomic and physiologic classification. So a different part um, that I can show you in a um, in, a, in a, a subsequent conversation about the guidelines is the fact that they've actually further clarified this. So what this guideline is relating to is the fact that um, there's actually a physiologic classification now in the newest ACHD guidelines. So we used to just classify patients based on their anatomic um, classification itself. So complex, you know, moderate, severe complexity. Um, so transposition patients would be significantly complex, severely complex. Now we have a physiologic classification as well. So do patients have um, any physiologic evidence of arrhythmia or of problems? So arrhythmias, heart failure. Um, so based on their physiologic class and their anatomic classification, the guidelines um, state whether or not patients should get the MRI or the echo. Um, the data, as I'm aware, is really related to the fact that these patients frequently have complications. I am absolutely not aware of any randomized control trials showing that people who didn't get annual, um, annual imaging did fared much worse. Um, I don't know if any of my Bach colleagues are on the call right now, um, but I think it relates to the fact that people want to get some assessment of ventricular function. Um, partly because of the fact that these patients end up having um, having ventricular failure sort of early on in their um, adulthood. So I think that it's kind of a conglomeration of data in order to get this um, guideline recommendation of one. I, I, think, I don't think that the level of evidence, obviously with the level of evidence, you can see that there's no randomized control trials. Problematic. I mean, I think this is our this is our problem in all of ACHD because there there really aren't enough data to suggest that we know what we're doing, and so we have to just come up with these sort of consensus guidelines. Um, 
We, uh, Karen, yeah. we do have one more question sure. um, from Mohsen Chaudhary. Since atrial arrhythmia is so common, is there any evidence for routine monitoring for arrhythmia in these patients? And also, is there any data for using DOAC versus warfarin for anticoagulation? Great questions. Um, yeah, so the uh, the second document that I'll show you a picture of later on, um, but was cited, I, th I think I cited it earlier in my talk, um, is this, uh, yeah, this this document here. Uh, Paul Carey and colleagues published it. It's called the PACES document. And it's a really nice review of uh, arrhythmias in congenital heart disease. And has a guideline based on the fact that it is recommended for patients to get Holter monitors on a semi-routine basis. There again, the frequency has not been determined, and I think that we've gotten away from the yearly Holter monitors um, with regards to asymptomatic arrhythmia mon monitoring. Um, it tends to be symptomatic, and so I think because of that, um, routine Holter monitoring isn't needed, but certainly frequent monitoring for any symptoms is, is certainly indicated. In terms of the DOAC versus um, other anticoagulation, there is a, a registry going on suggesting that um, DOACs in ACHD patients tends to be safe um, and tends to prevent arrhythmias, but there haven't been any head-to-head -head comparisons, and so I think that it's just kind of, it, it has become a style thing um, where we put patients on DOACs um, if possible and if the patients, we think the patients are going to do um, poorly on warfarin. Um, however, some purists sort of continue to put people on warfarin, uh, but more and more um, my colleagues in EP over at Children's tend to put patients on DOACs. In particular, they, they favor a Pixaban. Um, I think the issue though to keep in mind when it comes to any sort of, of, of DOAC with adult congenital heart disease patients is the fact that they're hepatically and renally cleared to varying degrees. And patients with congenital heart disease, um, in particular, transposition patients with mustards and sunnings, tend to have elevated venous pressures. And as a result of the elevated venous pressures, they have liver and kidney problems because um, the perfusion pressure has gone down because the venous pressure is up and then probably the, the systemic pressure is down too. Um, and so because of that, you have a very high frequency of cardiorenal syndrome and hepatic congestion. And so the biggest issue that I have um, that we all have to deal with when it comes to putting ACHD patients on DOACs is the monitoring of their renal and liver function to ensure that we're not over anticoagulating them because we certainly had um, bleeding events in the setting of DOACs that really sh we didn't anticipate. And that was just because we underestimated um, the GFR. And Carrie, one more question from Dan Kramer, whether you could expand upon the use of natriuretic peptides in these patients. Um, and he's wondering if different circulatory circuits lead to higher versus lower ANP or BNP relative to clinical heart failure. Hmm. Um, okay, so if you're asking, like, I don't know that there's a difference between sinning and mustards with regards to the BNP levels. I admittedly have not seen that many studies on ANP, um, so I can't really speak to that. My sense, my sort of vague recollection is that the ANP levels are really unreliable given the fact that so much of the atrium is scar. Um, with regards to BNP levels, they correlate with outcomes. Um, whether I don't recall that the absolute values are necessarily um, in studies higher than the average heart failure patient. Um, I think that it really relates to the fact, I, I think when it comes to comparing systemic right ventricle failure versus systemic left ventricular failure is our inability to sort of fully assess how sick patients are with systemic right ventricular dysfunction. And there are two reasons for that, I think. Um, the first reason is it is very hard to grade systemic ventricular function, particularly on echo, which is my assertion that CMR should be considered. Um, it's really hard to know. There's no standard. Um, there are a number, number of different like proposed ways to look at ventricular function, but as, as you saw, strain is the best, and strain is really hard to get. These patients' um, systemic right ventricles are midline, right underneath the sternum, and there's a ton of scar because of their surgery. And so it's very uncommon to actually be able to get quality imaging on them. And then the other problem is that they're young. And so as, as you know, sort of within all medicine, that young patients tend to compensate much further past a point of um, cardiac dysfunction um, when compared to older counterparts. And so I think the problem is that these patients tend to show up much sicker 
um, than we're anticipating and progress to florid heart failure extremely quickly. And that's probably in part due to the fact that their ventricular function has been bad for 10 years. Um, and so one of the things that we kind of do is just think about patients when they're in their 40s with systemic ventricular dysfunction. We actually act very quickly to get them over to the transplant team for evaluation. Um, we actually, the, I have a patient that was recently admitted to the hospital for heart failure and we ended up, it was his first admission ever for heart failure. And he ended up having his cardiac index was something like 1.9 or something on his first admission. And I think that that's just an example, but a very um, common example of patients really presenting an end-stage heart failure early on and unanticipated. And, and then not least of which I think is also the fact that pa patients are lost to follow up. Um, transition from pediatric to adult congenital care is very hard. Um, and one thing that, um, I, you know, I need your help on, honestly, everybody on the call, because getting these patients back into care is really hard. They, they hate doctors. They have a lot of PTSD associated with the multiple procedures that they've had. And so they often don't. And that was the case with this, this guy I'm talking about. He just didn't show up to my appointments. Um, and so I think because of all of those things, it, yeah, the BNP values are extremely high. But the problem there is that um, it's probably because he's in stage, not because there's like an inherent higher BNP. Great. Um, so from Lauren Feinberg, what is your box current anticoagulation strategy in pregnant women with corrected TGA? Um, so our, we're talking, I assume, about the atrial switch procedure, um, not congenitally corrected transposition. Because Correct. Okay. Um, so we don't have a standard anticoagulation procedure for anybody without a history of an atrial arrhythmia. Um, if we have... I would say that we don't have a protocol at all. I would say that we take it each person individually. In terms of um, systemic anticoagulation in the setting of pregnancy for the history of atrial arrhythmias, hmm, we do not keep them on, uh, my recollection is really just aspirin at this point. I don't recall having patients with sustained atrial arrhythmias in the setting of trans, do you have a patient with sustained atrial arrhythmias in the setting of a mustard? Uh, no, but I've had okay. patients with TGA who have been pregnant and have had like brief atrial arrhythmias, but not sustained. Yeah, we would just put them on aspirin. Okay. Um, but I think that is, we would need to, I mean, we would need to talk probably you and I, but I think in terms of like the um, systemic ventricular function is the real problem there. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, uh, that the, you know, we don't have like a CHAD score for transposition patients, but we often sort of infer mm -hmm. uh, from the ventricular function. Um, we don't have a ton, we haven't had a ton of uh, systemic ventricular, right ventricular patients with pregnancy by and large. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the issues is, which is sort of a topic for a different day, is the um, potential risk for ma making the ventricular function worse with worse. pregnancy. Yeah. 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 But good question. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. Well, I'll move on um, just so that we can be sure to get through the second component of the talk, which is really the more contemporary management. And this, um, I think, is the part that's going to apply to all of us as these patients age. So starting around 1985, we, uh, the patients were able to get the atrial, sorry, the arterial switch procedure. Intuitively, the right procedure to be done. Every time I show um, this anatomy to medical students for the first time, they immediately come up with the arterial switch because it makes so much sense. The problem was that it wasn't perfected um, for so long. Um, so what it is, is basically, and the issue is, is not just the coronary buttons. So this is the original anatomy. So the aorta um, is anterior and the coronary arteries come off anteriorly. And then uh, the pulmonary artery posteriorly needs to be brought forward, but that can't be done kind of in one fail swoop because you have to um, disconnect both. And then you have to somehow mobilize the branch pulmonary arteries, and then you kind of kink the aorta backwards. So you can see it's not a normal course of the aorta either. And as we we're going to talk through a little bit of the complications, and I think that's part of the thing to think about is that the aortic configuration is abnormal. The coronary arteries have been certainly have been stretched if not um, pulled too much and damaged in the process. And then we have to think about the fact that the pulmonary artery now has multiple levels of scar, the patch where the coronary arteries were, plus 
the anastomotic side patch and the fact that now it's been pulled forward in front of the ascending aorta, which is not normal. Um, we know that the normal configuration is for kind of the front back location of the pulmonary arteries. It's a great procedure. The initial um, survival has is five to 10 percent, really 10 percent relating to the 90s, 85 uh, to 90. Um, but now has a much higher survival rate. And, and if patients survive the needle natal, needle natal period, it's amazing, right? We've taken a procedure, um, a patient's life, from having a certain death by the age of 50 or 60 to being what we feel to be having a really good chance at living at least into their 50s and 60s without clear issues. Now, the news isn't as good as it originally was. Um, when I first started learning about congenital heart disease as a resident at BI um, several years ago, I thought this was an amazing procedure and had been told that these patients would have a near normal lifespan. Probably not true. Um, it's not terrible, but it's just not quite what we were hoping, and that really has to do with all of these scars. So let's talk about that. Um, so the biggest issue are the anatomic site complications, and this is showing you, um, this is an MRI showing you the Lecompte component. So we call it an arterial switch with a Lecompte maneuver. The Lecompte maneuver is just the name for that bump, bringing the aorta, I mean, aorta backwards in the pulmonary artery anteriorly. And what happens is that the branch pulmonary arteries get tethered. And so you can see here that this patient has a stent that has been crushed by the weight of the pulmonary artery pushing against or the tension um, against the pulmonary artery and the aorta being immediately posterior to it. And so it ends up happening, and this is a very common complication, up to 80% in some studies, um, patients get branch pulmonary artery stenosis, or they get stenosis at those anastomotic sites, so the supravalvar region. So very common. Um, the complications vary by center, but something important to kind of think about and relate to, you know, when we're thinking about that patient I mentioned at the beginning, a 23-year-old with an arterial switch presents to the emergency room with chest pain. What do you think about? Is it because the patient has severe branch PA stenosis and has systemic right ventricular pressures that are now finally symptomatic, or is it something else? Um, so here's just an example. I just wanted to show you the echo. So this is just a regular old parasternal long axis. The only thing I want to show you is just the fact that the aorta and pulmonary artery arise at a slightly different angle than you probably are used to. Um, this is just a little unusual to look at. Um, but this is an example of brand, or sorry, um, supravalvar PS. So here's the pulmonary artery. And then you can see it kind of gets narrow immediately. Um, these images are difficult, as you can see. Um, but you can see that the flow acceleration starts right after the valve. And so this is at the location of where the great arteries were switched. And so this, what we end up calling it is neopulmonary valve, because this was, this was the aorta originally, the aortic valve. And now it's the pulmonary valve, so we call it a neopulmonary valve. And this was originally a pulmonary valve and is now an aortic valve, so we call it a neoaortic valve. It's just the nomenclature. Um, so stenoses um, at the anastomotic sites are very common. Um, the other thing to think about um, is the neoaortic root. So that root used to be a pulmonary artery. You know, it, it maybe it's because the wall itself is slightly thinner and less able to deal with systemic pressures, or maybe it has to do with the fact that the geometry of the aorta has completely changed. Um, I think that we've obviously been learning that for a long time, that the geometry above and below the valve is just as important as the valve itself with regards to long-term valve function. And these are just two graphs showing you um, the outcomes from one study, although many studies have shown similar findings, um, that the root dilates pretty significantly over time. And so you can see here, 20 years after arterial switch, which is essentially 20-year-old person, um, has a four centimeter root. And if this graph continues, every patient is eventually going to need a root replacement. Um, probably not because of the root itself, but because of the neoaortic root regurgitation. Um, and so we've seen just in the last five to 10 years, a progression in patients having severe aortic valve regurgitation, needing an aortic valve replacement. Um, this is just, we're just at the beginning of it. I think that we're gonna um, have to just wait and see. Um, as I'm aware, there haven't been any reports of a neoaortic root dissection purely based on um, the diameter, although that's something also to keep 
watching for because obviously these patients are just getting to the range of developing additional things that make dissection more likely, such as systemic hypertension and diabetes. Any questions on these two things so far? Um, okay, I'll just, I'll just have a still frame here to show you. This is the neoaortic root dilation. So it's pretty dramatic. Um, this is in, I think, I feel like this patient was around 25. Um, so really, really dilated aortic root with it's basically the same dimension as the left ventricle. Um, so a, a common complication that we're gonna have to wait and see what we do with. Okay, and then the thing that I kind of saved for last for, for everyone on the call is something that's gonna relate to everybody. Um, so coronary arteries are problematic when it comes to um, arterial switches for a couple of reasons. One is because they had to be reimplanted, but more importantly, 25% of patients in most studies with transposition that had repair had anomalous coronaries. And so here is a really nice graph from one of my favorite textbooks written by Dr. Geva and colleagues over at Children's. Um, the fellows all have access to this uh, textbook. And so what you can see is the relative prevalence of the different um, anomalies. And as you can see here, the most common anomalous configuration is to have a left circumflex off the right um, that then gets translocated. They, they kind of do the translocation from the facing sinuses. Um, but you can see that it's not entirely uncommon to have a single coronary, and obviously that can be quite problematic if one of the branches got stretched during surgery. Um, so it's not common to develop coronary artery disease purely based on anat anatomic reasons, um, pretty uncommon so far, 3%, but it is going to be common to have a patient come in with regular old ASCVD um, for their coronary angiogram at the age of 60 with a history of transposition. And it's going to be difficult. I think, number one, it's going to be difficult because of these multiple um, anomalous configurations, but also because of the complex root anatomy. Um, so I showed you kind of the up and down of the aorta is much more steep of a curve, plus that new aortic root dilates and dilates and dilates. And so uh, engaging these coronary arteries, I think, is going to be really difficult when these patients finally age into the 50, 60, 70 year old range in which we are doing urgent angiography. And I just bring this up and remind you again that this is the most common, um, one of the most common types of complex congenital heart disease. And so I think the chances that we're going to see these patients presenting with acute demise um, isn't tiny. And if they are like many of our other patients that don't have a lot of complications, they may or may not be followed um, by congenital clinic or tell you um, about their anatomy. Um, so just something to be aware of if you have a patient um, to just, uh, I just keep a, a picture of this on my phone, actually, just so that I remember um, all of the different anatomic classifications if I needed an emergency. Any questions on this issue? All right, well, we are to the end of my slides and I hope that people have things to discuss because I would love to talk more about some of these issues. Um, so what will we think about this first patient? Um, so the 45 year old woman with transposition who comes in with shortness of breath and palpitations. Um, so, fellows that have come on Bach, what's the first thing you're going to do when you see this patient? I'm going to find somebody. Tim, tell me, Tim, what would you want to do for this patient, 45 year old woman who comes into the ER with shortness of breath and palpitations? I would um, get a 12 lead EKG, hook up a telly, see if there's a steady on um, varying heart rate, and I'd examine the EKG to see if there's any evidence of IART. Love it. And we're going to ask for the old EKG, because that, I think, is often the key to making this diagnosis. So you'll call me up, or we'll log into some system and uh, get the old ECG. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Um, and so for this patient, the transposition patient with chest pain, um, it really could be anything. Uh, it could be that this patient is one of the 3% of people who actually does have a coronary issue related to their anomalous coronary or reimplantation. Or it could be that the patient actually has severe branched PS and is just becoming symptomatic because we have no idea what a 23 year old may or may not have been doing um, at college to cause additional increase in pulmonary artery pressure. Um, so a couple of, of unique patients, but I think hopefully um, you guys can appreciate now that these patients tend to have heart failure and arrhythmias. These patients tend to have anastomotic uh, 
and surgical related complications. So here's the summary. Um, so patients uh, after the atrial switch have arrhythmias and heart failure. And the focus really um, is on both the management of the arrhythmias and heart failure, but then also just making sure that we're not missing something with regards to the baffle itself. Um, whereas in the arterial switch patients, they actually have an excellent survival. But we have to keep thinking about the fact that these anatomic sites may be problematic, particularly the aortic root. That dilation is going to be asymptomatic and so definitely needs um, ongoing surgical, uh, sorry, uh, imaging monitoring. We need to think about the coronary arteries for now, but we need to burn into our brains the fact that when these patients start showing up with acute MIs, those, those coronary arteries are going to have to take a creative um, and thoughtful approach. All right. Well, what questions do you all have? Uh, this is Al Buxton. I have a question for you about yeah. the sudden death issue. Okay. And, and that is, do we know whether this is more related to myopathy, ventricular myopathy developed? Is it related to the coronary anomalies or the um, potential complications, as, as you mentioned, after the coronary reimplantation. What, what do we know about these mechanisms? Because I, I don't believe they get reentrant VTs, monomorphic VTs. Is that correct? Um, I mean, not, that's not the first thing that, that I've read about. The risk factors for sudden cardiac death um, are certainly the myopathic ones, as you talked about. Um, the other issue is the IART um, conducting into VT sort of speeding up the heart and causing the ischemia related or, you know, the other mechanisms by which atrial arrhythmia is caused with ventricular arrhythmias. But I think the issue that you bring up about coronary arteries is particularly, I was so interested in that when I first started looking up transposition patients and did a whole bunch of literature reviews on, um, do these anomalous coronaries correlate with the sudden cardiac death risk. And there have been tons, there have been a lot of um, retrospective chart reviews that have not shown that. Um, uh, annoyingly, I, I thought too that given the high rate of, of anomalous coronary, surely that must relate to an abnormal coronary blood flow. Very few of these patients end up having acute MIs. Having said that, um, Paul Carey, who is the lead author on this document on the right, actually did just publish um, uh, autopsy review of three transposition patients who died of sudden death, and two of them actually had acute MIs. And so I don't know if it's just random chance that he ended up having those two patients, um, or if it's just that we need to look carefully. Interestingly enough, though, his two patients didn't have anomalous coronaries. They actually had the normal coronary artery um, distribution. So in answer to your question, I think so far, what we think is that the anomalous coronaries don't necessarily relate to the sudden death of the atrial switch patients. Um, in the arterial switch patients, they haven't had a lot of sudden death events. And so at this point, we don't know. Um, we haven't seen a lot of, of issues long-term in these patients. The coronary issues tend to be the reason that they don't survive childhood. So the five to 10% of uh, death in um, the neonatal period is related to the coronary artery reimplantation issue. Um, I think, are, were those all your questions or am I missing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Peter, did you have anything to say? No, no, not at all. I think that that was certainly, okay. um, so we certainly have no expertise in this, so. Well, you guys are, you guys are the arrhythmia experts and I cannot be convinced otherwise, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kerry, we do have a couple more questions coming in on the chat. Yeah. Um, so from Warren Manning, are the coronary anomalies usually identified at the time of arterial switch surgery and are they corrected at that time? Uh, no, they're not, they can't really be corrected because you'd have to like really stretch them around. I mean, if we're talking about um, an anomalous coronary with an abnormal takeoff, sure. Um, if we're talking about something that was intraarterial um, then that, that would be unroofed at the time of the switch, um, ish. Although I think that my, my understanding of the pediatric approach is really to just, you know, get a good result one way or the other and then deal with things later because you don't really know how the baby's going to grow. Um, but yeah, um, certainly taking care of the really malignant courses. But I think the other, the issue that I should do, you know, 13% of patients have the left off the right, they just leave it because to move it would probably put the patient at risk for the stretching and, and pulling of the artery. Um, and what was your other question? 
Uh, so there's one more question. How often do you order CPETs in this population and how does a procedure dictate therapy? Uh, yeah, so I get, um, we, are, we are a CPET heavy group over at Children's. And one of the reasons is because ACHD patients are historically quite poor at assessing their um, functional capacity. It's actually been shown um, that if you, assess, if you ask a patient with congenital heart disease how, how they feel and if they are at their baseline, they're going to say yes more often than the average person. So this disability paradox, I feel fine even though I've been sick my whole life. Um, and so because of that, we actually really need um, some objective measures of, of exercise capacity. And for that reason, we often get um, exercise tests. As well, we also get them because a lot of these patients have such high risk of arrhythmia. We often find that patients will develop arrhythmias during exercise tests, and we'd rather you know, know it then. Plus, the fact that, as many of you probably know, I am a huge enthusiast with regards to recommending exercise to our patients. And so I like it a lot because I use I do exercise prescriptions all the time in my clinic and frequently talk to patients about maximizing their exercise capacity. And we even have um, a cardiac fitness program at uh, Boston Children's Hospital where we, it's a small program. We do one-on-one -on -one fitness training in the way of cardiac rehab, but it's just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so we do that, you know, as well with the exercise tests if they're extremely limited. Um, we do exercise tests a lot on patients with, um, transposition and atrial switch because the patients end up having heart failure so frequently. One of the things that predicts heart failure is a decline in VO2 and peak VO2. Um, the other reason we get um, cardiopulmonary exercise tests is to assess the pulmonary function. One issue that I didn't talk as much about is that in these patients with branch pulmonary stenosis after transposition arterial switch, um, they can have abnormal pulmonary blood flow and thus abnormal lung function. And so sometimes it's useful um, and in a diagnostic purpose. But I do, um, I do fairly frequent um, CPETs like every couple of years, every three years for my systemic right ventricle patients. Um, and then less frequent, but still, but I still do them quite a bit, um, CPETs for the other patients, in part just because I want to make sure that they're doing as well as they say that they are. Wonderful. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and um, hopefully we'll have a chance, all of us, to see you in person uh, after, after the quarantine times are over. <laughs> yes. Um, before I close, let me just show you two things. So first, this, these are the two documents. Everyone should download. This one's available on the app. Um, and then this is my clinic. So if any of you have any um, patients, just email Schaefer Clinic. Uh, thank you, Eli, for setting those up. And we will be sure to get the patient in. I have plenty of openings, obviously. COVID-wise, but even not COVID-wise, I have plenty of clinic patient, uh, clinic slots. Fantastic. Thank you Thank so much, you. Carrie. We'll see everyone next week. Yes, thanks.